Welcome back to the Brahmin Word, and we are continuing on not just with the life of Daniel, but his visions as well. Um, so go to Daniel chapter 8. We're going to do the whole chapter because uh, a lot of it is same to what we have seen already, especially when it comes to the rising and the fall of empires, uh, which we've already touched base on a couple of times uh, in the life of Daniel. Uh, but there is something here that's really, really fascinating. Uh, and I think it really gives some explanation to the fact that God is watching over. And yes, bad individuals do come to power, but they do not come to power forever. Uh, they do end. Their reign of terror ends. And we see that here uh, with a very, uh, with a certain individual in history. Uh, so with that being said, turn to uh, Daniel chapter 8. Uh, Daniel chapter 8, uh, we are going to start in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. So this is still in the Babylonian Empire time period, um, which is very important because, again, it it shows that this prophecy is a prophecy uh, because the Medes and Persians have not taken over yet. Uh, verse 2, And I saw in the vision, when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Uli Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward, and northward, and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased, and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth, without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal. And he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him cl come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And the host will be given over to it together with regular burnt offering because of transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression, that makes desolate, and the giving over the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For twenty-three hundred evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. So you have this dream of this ram and this goat. And again, it's it's talking about uh, the empires that are coming up. But then you have this little horn, which takes you back to Daniel chapter 7. But there are some differences. There are a lot of similarities, which is why some people believe uh, that the person described here and interpreted in just a second is the Antichrist. But I think here in Daniel chapter 8, it's actually a very specific person, a human person in history, in global history, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes or Antiochus the Fourth or Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. I'm going to go with Antiochus Epiphanes here. But it's, it's very, very accurate how uh, 
Antiochus Epiphanes is described, uh, which brings up something that I think is really fascinating. Uh, but with that, let's get to uh, the inter to the interpretation because, as like before, Daniel is well very confused and kind of freaking out a little bit. Verse fifteen. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli. And he called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. So, a couple things here. Uh, is Gabriel this uh, being that has the appearance of a man? I think it's just talking about an, an angelic figure. Uh, so, an angel, an angel named Gabriel. Is that the same Gabriel that is mentioned in the Gospels uh, with Mary, the mother of Jesus? Yes, absolutely. I definitely think it is the same angelic figure uh, in both here and in the Gospels, which I think is really cool. Uh, second, when he describes Daniel as son of man at the end of verse 17, I don't think it's in the same way that he's talking about the son of God uh, and his relationship with the ancient of days in Daniel chapter 7. I think there is definitely a distinction. I think within this vision uh yeah, this vision state, this dream state uh, that Daniel is in, and, uh, the angel Gabriel is just identifying Daniel as a human being, and so therefore calls him son of man. Uh, so I think that is what is going on there in uh, verse 17. So now we get to the interpretation, but before we do... That's where we see Daniel continue to freak out. Uh, verse 18. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and made me stand up. Um, there is a theory that deep sleep here uh, actually means uh, that Daniel died in this dream state. First off, what would that even be? mean <laughs> um no i th i think it is literally he just passes out from shock uh, <laughs> which i probably would do the same uh but and the angel gabriel helps him out gets him up uh and then begins the interpretation verse 19 he uh gabriel said Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia, and the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall rise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. So, this is really, really fascinating. So, yes, you have, again, the prophecy of the Medes and the Persians, which we have already seen a couple times in the life of Daniel. You do have the Grecian Empire also uh, predicted in the life of Daniel as well. But here you actually hear the words Greece, and that is, or the word Greece, and that is really, really fascinating. But not only that, but you see the life of Alexander the Great here, which is really fascinating. So Alexander the Great is one of the great kings in global history. And when he conquered the Medes and the Persian Empire, it was like his army was off the ground. They were going so quickly um, with the type of style and uh, schematics that Alexander the Great and his generals drew up. I mean, they were almost like they were just hovering over the ground and conquering as they went. Well, the dream itself literally describes the goat in that manner, and that is incredible incredibly fascinating to me. Um, 
Look again at verse at verse five. As I was considering, behold, a male goat, a male goat too. So that's Alexander the Great came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. I think there it's not saying that Alexander the Great literally had powers of flying <laughs> like he was he was the first man to fly no 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 i don't think it's talking about planes i think it's literally talking about the very fast and quick uh military mindset and schematics that alexander the great the great and his generals put into motion in order to conquer the medes and the persians and this is prophesied way before that even happens which is fascinating to me um, and then you have the death of Alexander the Great uh, sometime in 323 BC. And when that happens, you have uh, four of his generals, advisors, whatever you want to call them. Uh, you have Cassander, uh, you have uh, Lysimachus, or uh, Ly Lysimachus. Lysimachus, Lysimachus, there you go. Uh, Lysimachus, you have Seleucus, you have, um, and then you have Ptolemy. You have those four guys split the Greek, the Grecian kingdom. And so there are some that believe the Greek, the Grecian empire ended at 323 BC. And then this time of Hellenism or the Hellenistic, uh, time period started from 323 BC until about 31 to 27 BC, which is when the Roman Empire really became a thing. Um, and which is really, really fascinating that again, this is all prophesied hundreds of years before, uh, which is fascinating. And then, uh, you have, um, and then you have this little horn, which is Antiochus Epiphanes. And so let's look at his description, uh, which is the rest of, or the rest of the chapter. Verse 24. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction, and shall succeed in what he does, and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great. Without warning he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no human hand." The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for many day for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. So you have this little horn, uh, and it is supposed to represent Antiochus Epiphanes. And what's fascinating is not only do you have the Medes and the Persians, and then you have Alexander the Great with the breaking of his Grecian Empire to the four uh, generals. And so you have all of that predicted, but now you have Antiochus Epiphanes, and he is predicted so correctly here in Daniel chapter 8, that there are many that believe that this whole entire chapter could not have been written by Daniel because it was so accurate in its description of the Medes and the Persians, Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire, uh, the Hellenistic time period, and Antiochus Epiphanes, and then the, uh, is just fascinating to me that that is the case. And so I think it is wonderful to see that because it makes you go, okay, yes, yeah, you could bring out that debate. But here's the problem, though, as we've seen, as we walk through the life of Daniel, this is not the first time Daniel does this. He has predicted global history multiple times now. You have uh, you have one vision uh, in or the first vision of Nebuchadnezzar, which literally does this with a golden statue, and then or part of gold, the statue, and then you have the second. Uh, the second dream is literally predicting the fall of Nebuchadnezzar. 
uh, with his restoration, but the fall of Nebuchadnezzar. And then you have the handwriting on the wall, which predicts the fall of the Babylonian Empire and the rise of the Medes and the Persians. Then you have Daniel chapter 7, and yet all of that isn't debated, and yet this one is. And I think it's because it is so accurate that people cannot get their minds around that Daniel would know this, unless God is God, right? <laughs> and so that to me is a wonderful thing to see as we see the life of Daniel. Um, but here, let's talk about Antiochus Epiphanes a little bit. You have this guy and he starts persecuting uh, Israel, which I believe is what is described in uh, in the uh, in the dream as uh, the the precious, the glorious land in verse 9. The glorious land, especially to Daniel, described by Daniel, would be Jerusalem, uh, would be Israel. And so he does go to Israel, Antiochus Epiphany does, in about 170 BC, and uh, begins to and begins to uh, persecute them. And then you have him really desecrate the temple in about 168 BC until 164 BC, which is uh, thought to be the Maccabean Revolt, uh, which is uh, takes place in the, the intertestamental time period between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. Here, it's really, really fascinating because the way that he is described is very much how uh, his historians would describe Antiochus Epiphanes. He believed he was right in his own mind, and yet the way that he comes to power and how brutal he is, it is like he is being led by something else. So for me, personally, when it's talking about in verse 24, his power shall be great, but not by his own power. I think he literally is being guided by Satan, by demonic forces to, to bring this persecution to Israel. I think that is what is going on there. Uh, because he goes about, when it's talking about the uh, the prince of princes, when it's talking about uh, the burnt offerings and the sanctuary, uh, the transgression, uh, he literally brings in a statue of the pagan god Jupiter to the temple. Uh, and not only that, but then sacrifices pigs, which were unclean in Jewish law, he literally sacrifices pigs in the temple to desecrate uh, the Lord Jehovah and who he is. I mean, this is absolutely described here. Now, when it's talking about his fall in verse 25, um, and he shall be broken by, by, but by no human hand, there's a couple ideas here. So first you have the death of Antiochus Epiphanes in about 163 BC. Um, a lot of, there are a lot of theories out there, uh, but some there there's a lot of religious uh, part of that when it comes to pagan temples and him dying shortly after attacking one. So there is that theory. Um, the other one, too, when it says he shall be broken, I think it could be referencing the Maccabean Revolt. Yes, the Maccabean Revolt uh, was led by uh, the Maccabean family, but there... Uh, especially if you look into uh, the book of uh, the books of Maccabee, um, it is really obvious that the Lord had a part to play in that, which I think could reference by, that "by no human hand" phrase at the end of verse twenty-five. But, however, the main point is that Antiochus Epiphanes, yes, he is brought up, and yes, he is persecuting uh, Jews for a time, but then God steps in and says, okay, enough is enough. And it's interesting that when that revolt happens in 164 BC, it is not very much longer until the death of Antiochus Epiphanes, again, about 163 BC. So maybe not even a year later he dies. That's not a coincidence to me. Uh, and the 2300 days here, uh, it could refer to, some believe that it could refer to 11, 
150 days uh, or half of that because the morning is an evenings uh, thing which would be like 60, the 168 to 164 BC, the, the start of the desecration of the temple until the revolt. Yes, I could definitely see where you're getting at, but I really do like the full seven years, or 170 BC to 164 BC, um, which would be about 2300 uh, days or evenings and mornings. Um, so either one could work, but I really do like that 2300 full days aspect. But the point is that God has dictated this from the beginning. And yes, he does allow these types of persecution, but they always, always have an end date. He will never, ever allow persecution to reign from day one all the way through uh, the rest of eternity. Even Satan, yes, he had this, this, this time period where he was a very perfect angel in the presence of God. He then fell, he sinned, he then fell, and then uh, with him falling, with him uh, becoming Satan, uh, we, he now has a very numbered days. Yes, it's lasted a very long time, and we don't know when it's going to end exactly. But at one point, Jesus will come back and will say, okay, enough is enough, and that will be the end of his reign and of all sin and death. And so that is the thing for me that I take away from this vision and this dream is that, yes, there will be a time when it seems like evil and death have its reign. And yet God orchestrates down to the year, down to the day, down to the moment, exactly when that evil stops. He says, OK, enough is enough. I'm taking over. And it's not because he couldn't in the, in the time before, but he, he is using uh, those times that are very, very difficult, yes, to test, but also to bring folks that do not believe in him a chance to believe in him. And I think that's very, very important to see when it comes not just to global history, but when it comes to the struggles that you and I face uh, in our daily life today. Uh, those struggles, yes, they are really, really hard, and they're really awful to go through, but they have their moment, and they have their time, and they will come to an end at some point. It may not be what you want, but it is what, it is what God has in plan and in store. So with that being said, there's a lot that you can learn from these visions. And so we will continue on with that uh, with Daniel chapter 9. Uh, and I will see you then as we get, get into that chapter on Thursday. Thanks.